welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with primitive survival specialist and ancient knife maker, Donnie Dust. Now, when I say ancient knife maker, I mean the knives are ancient, not Donnie. Uh, I first got sucked into his addictive and vicariously appealing content on YouTube when one of his many flint napping video shorts dropped in my feed. Thank you, YouTube algorithm. It was a close-up contemplative 60 seconds of some anonymous rock transforming into a perfect stone knife blade through various strikes with other rocks, pressure breaks with a well-worn elk bone, and other percussive micro-adjustments. With a built-in love of knives and a depth of their history as our first tool, I was absolutely hooked on Donnie's work. We'll talk all about what it takes to survive an ancient situation. Who knows? We might need to know that sooner rather than later and talk about how he learned all this cool stuff. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that notification bell and share the show with a friend. Also, you can download the show to your favorite podcast app. If you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, it's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Adventure Delivered, your monthly subscription for hand-picked outdoor, survival, EDC, and other cool gear from our expert team of outdoor professionals. Theknifejunkie.com slash BattleBox. Donnie, welcome to the Knife Junkie podcast, sir. Right on. Thank you so much for having me, Bob. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, Before we get started, I want to congratulate you on your new book, Wild Wisdom. Thank that is so out much. by publishing giant Simon and Schuster. I was, I got to say, I was shocked to see who was publishing it. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I was, uh, it was, it was quite a process. I spent a lot of time inside, which is kind of new for me, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a great book and uh, people are really enjoying it. So yeah. Ah, I didn't think of that. Spending a lot of time inside writing, obviously probably sitting in front of a computer, something you probably uh, had to be chained down to do. Uh, did you have anyone helping you editing? I'm sure you did, but I mean, what was that process like? Yeah. So, I mean, the the entire process, I mean, my, my first two books were self-published and for this third one, it was a whole new experience working with a, you know, an editor and kind of a whole publishing team. And, um, for me, I, I kind of sought out the guidance of kind of a writing coach that I could kind of bounce ideas off with. Cause there's, you know, the editor that's lined with, you know, the publishing house, but I just sought out like, um, an individual by the name of Gary. And, um, he was just, he was helping me. So I would write like a chapter and then I would send it to him and he'd be like, I have no idea what you're trying to say here, but I think I got an idea. So he was kind of my, my writing muse, my writing coach in his process. And, um, you know, over the course of pretty much a fall into a winter, um, I would just bounce emails off him and he, he was, he gave me some really sage advice when it came to writing. Cause I enjoy writing, but I never really had to, uh, write at this level on this capacity. So it was a whole new challenge, but it was worth it. Well, I guess that's the real challenge, uh, to get a modern, uh, person to understand some of these more primitive ideas in the, in the briefest way possible. Uh, You have a a really interesting sort of tagline or logo that I noticed on your website (laughs) and that I've seen uh, from time to time on your IG, which is creativity is your first survival tool. Uh, As we get into this conversation about primitive survival techniques and just uh, primitive almost uh, doesn't do it justice. It uh, just basic and uh, 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 um, primeval. Uh, In any case, what does that mean? Creativity is your first survival tool. Well, I think, you know, for, for a lot of folks that venture out into the bush, um, whether they are practitioners of survival in its traditional form or bushcraft or primitive skills or earth skills, um, when you really think about all the different challenges one might face, uh, you're really using your creative problem-solving process to address those challenges. So if it is building a fire or a shelter or finding water, yes, you have those kind of core knowledge, skills, and abilities, but sometimes you are leveraging your creative mind and your creative approach to really addressing those problems. So it's kind of a, it's kind of a unique thing where I like to instill in people that everybody is creative. Everything you see around us, we have made, we've created, and you can 
take that and do that same sort of kind of approach out in the natural world and get some pretty amazing results. Well, uh, what, um, give us an example of someone out in the wilderness being creative. I, uh, in my job, I find that, uh, when I create a process to make something easy and repeatable, I feel like that's a, a, a good way to put my creative uh, mind to work. Uh, but give us an example of in a survival situation from your perspective, this. Yeah, I, I think one of the easiest ways to uh, kind of approach that creative process is to spend one night in the bush knowing you're going to spend a second night. And that first night in the bush you're probably going to be cold. You might get these weird air pockets that are moving through your shelter, or maybe you're laying on the ground, or you just don't have enough things really to kind of keep you warm. And through that creative process and that kind of analyzing the situation you were faced in the night before, what steps can you take to make yourself warmer, to give yourself a little bit more shielding from, you know, a cold wind or potential rain? And it's just it's problem solving. It's using that idea of saying, all right, I was completely uncomfortable laying on the ground and my, my, my hips and my back were cold all night. Well, what can I use? What can I do to improve upon that situation? So whether it's cutting more grass, collecting, you know, pine boughs or leaves to create a little bit of padding, you're using your creative. It doesn't require any sort of extensive training to solve a simple problem. And the bush will present all sorts of problems but in that creative sort of process, um, you can really address your needs. I mean, with not a lot of tools. I mean, for someone who's very minimal in ways, some of my biggest challenges are just solving the simple problems using what the natural environment, you know, ultimately provides. Uh, coming from someone who uh, uh, did did very little out in the bush. I never did anything in the bush. What am I talking about? Uh, you know, I'm a, I, I grew up suburban, went urban for 20 odd years, and now I'm suburban again and a, and a dad. And I find myself watching videos like yours. And uh, there it, it, it's, it taps into something, especially you were talking about making yourself warm. And I happen to know that you, just from watching your videos, you know how to start fire like in, in any condition. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tell, tell me about a little bit about the hierarchy of survival tools. It seems like fire might be primo. Yeah, I, you know, I always kind of say if if you're if you're operating in any sort of environment, I kind of operate in these three praxes, a high tech, a low tech and a no tech sort of zone or box, if you will. And those zones can kind of overlay. So let's say if I'm going out into the bush, I might be wearing modern clothes but I might be carrying all, you know, homemade gear, uh, uh, a backpack made of an elk hide and some moccasins and very simple stuff. But with within that, and I think about my priorities, I'm always thinking about what are the hardest things to replicate in the bush? And because it's very easy to carry lighter, lighter and make a fire. So when it comes to addressing my core needs, I kind of focus on something that's a blade in respects, a cutting tool, if you will. Uh, some form of a blanket or barrier, like a wool blanket or even just a, a sleeping bag or a weather appropriate jacket. Um, some aspect of a bottle and typically a steel water bottle or, uh, you know, a, a clay pot, something I can boil water in. And then an aspect of burn. And that burn is just something that aids in your fire making process. Maybe it's a hearth board or maybe it is a ferro rod or some tinder. And those four things are very hard to just create naturally out in the bush. So when it comes to the fire, I like to kind of give myself a little bit of an advantage because you can resource a lot of these things. But if I know that it's 45 degrees out in the mountains, yes, I've battled that environment before, but why not just make it a little bit easy? So maybe I'll bring some ideal tinder and, uh, you know, in a hand drill. And when it comes to fire, I think when you have spent enough days in the bush, whether you're in the Amazon, Louisiana, Africa, and the mountains, you learn not necessarily the ideal pieces of wood, but you learn the properties of the wood that best suits a hand drill or a bow drill or a fire plow, something to that extent. So I try not to focus on, I need to know a thousand plants. I focus on the properties of the plants that will work best when it really comes to addressing fire. So you mentioned all these different environs, uh, Louisiana, Africa, uh, you've been all over the world, uh, yeah. in, and, and roughing it, not, not, uh, you know, you've been roughing it all over the place. So, so you're saying what you're looking for in terms of starting a fire is 
certain characteristics in the okay it's damp here yeah. now i need to look for x y and z yeah so like you know in the amazon's one of those great examples where i'm looking for let's say if i'm going to do a hand drill I'm looking for the properties that makes a good spindle and a good hearth board. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm focusing on. I might not know any of the plants there. I'm, I mean, you know, some and some other ones you don't know, but you could come across a material and say, wow, I think this might be a great hearth board. You put it in your pocket and away you go. So focusing on the properties allows you to really break down the kind of key components on the ideal friction fire sets when you're in those unique environments. Uh, something that I've learned recently just from watching videos like yours and, and right. others is, is that rotten logs, you know, that have been, you know, you know, around my entire life. I didn't realize they created, uh, that they, they supply, if you dig in some great smoldering wood and great yeah. smoking wood, I think I saw you smoking some deer. Um, uh, and, and so things like that and starting fire when it's wet. Uh, to someone like myself has always been mystifying, but as I kind of un unlock some of these things, I'm trying them on my own yeah. and seeing that uh, it you know might take some doing and it doesn't happen as quickly as you expect, uh, but that it happens. Uh, I, I want to ask you this 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 question about time in a survival situation. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, those of us who live in the modern world and and do modern things all the time, we plan our our days uh, according to time, and it always goes longer than we expect. But when we're talking about the kind of things you do out in the bush, how the hell do you plan? I mean, it must take way longer than you expect. Yeah, I mean, time is is a factor in a lot of things. Um, I usually do a lot of time factoring when it comes to building a shelter, and that, and it's not necessarily the amount of time um that i'll need to build the shelter it's the amount of time i'll be spending in a location if i'm going to be spending a week in a location i might build a shelter that's a little bit more robust a little bit more comfortable but knowing that i have a week ultimately to do it i don't feel as rushed i guess you could say if i'm only staying in a place for one night because i'm moving through from point a to point b it's a pile of leaves that's when i factor in time as far as the requirements to actually build that shelter so you kind of factor in time in a lot of different ways, but I think you have to understand survival is really, it's it's about just getting by. You're getting by with the bare minimum and you're not really thriving. And my goal is to ultimately kind of go from survival to that kind of thrival mode where you have the luxuries, you have the comfort, you have the supply of food and, and water and you feel safe and you feel secure. So when it comes to time, it's going to take a little bit of time to get to that kind of thriving sort of zone. But with more exposure and time out in the bush and understanding of the flora and the fauna and the environments that you're in, you can kind of speed that process up a little bit because you're familiar with, mm -hmm. you know, the properties of the wood or the best ways to catch fish or understanding game trails that are in Africa are going to be the same sort of game trails and, and property wise that you might find in the States. <laughs> well, I've been thinking about that and, and it's like, uh, trial and error is great in almost every other way of life. You kind of get to know things just through doing them over and over, but in a survival situation, it kind of seems like you don't have that luxury, uh, for yeah. too long, you know, mm -hmm. the, 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 you can be creative, uh, to a point. Sure. What, what do you say, uh, I mean, from, from your perspective, uh, how do you plan for that if you're not, uh, if you find yourself thrust in that situation and you're not someone who spends their days uh, figuring this stuff out. Yeah. And I think you hit the nail on the head right off the bat is that if you find yourself thrusted into that situation and you have to really think about it, most of the people that go out and practice survival, bushcraft, primitive skills, it it is ultimately a self-induced survival situation. You are cognitively mm. putting yourself there. So within that cognitive landscape, you have certain controls left and right. You can say, you know what? Uh, instead of one blanket, I'm going to bring two. Instead of bringing my stone knife, I'm going to bring my steel blade. So 99.9% .9 of the time, that's what people are doing. But there's that 0.1% of the time where it's that real situation. And in that real situation, it's 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 one of those things where you have to kind of factor in where am I at environmental-wise, where am I at health-wise, and what am I looking to do? Am I injured? Do I need to get back to my truck so I can drive out of here? Um, have I, you know, snapped a leg and I need to kind of give myself first aid? So 
it's hard to dabble in that world where it's real because most survival that you see on YouTube and all these situations, we have control over it. And mm. that's the one thing I try to paint to an audience is that <clears throat> my ability to go out into the bush with a stone knife has come from years of experience and, and years experimenting in different environments. I don't recommend it right off the bat for folks, but this is kind of the approach because your aim is to get to that point where you know your self-induced survival is almost real. So that's limiting your gear and kind of giving yourself a harsher environment. But, um, you know, if folks are looking to kind of go down this thing, it's it's great to just start going out in the bush, start start seeing the flora and the fauna, smelling the environment, spending a night there, spending two nights there, and just yep. building up that ground truth into your personal experiences. I, I think it's spending the night it's a huge difference. <laughs> yeah. uh, my daughter and I just camped out in the backyard. I'm telling you, I'm way suburban, sir. So, I mean, like <laughs> camping out in the backyard is like, wow, man, listen to all those sounds. And we hear them. We'd, we'd leave our windows open, but to be out there. And I know, and we're taking incremental steps Perfect. to get further and further out. Um, I always think of this when I'm on a plane, which is not that frequently, but I kick off my shoes. I, I ease my seat back and I doze off, which I can do pretty much anywhere I am. But on an airplane, right. I think if this goes down and I live, what happens next? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I think we all run that scenario in our brain when we're right on a plane. Some of us are like, oh, you know, I hope nobody gets hurt, but I'd like to give it a shot. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think as, as long as people are kind of finding that opportunity to go camping in the backyard or to go on those hikes and spend a simple night or maybe even a weekend, they're making small steps into their own personal rewilding, which is kind of the, mm -hmm. the, the idea behind my book, Wild Wisdom, is to give people those foundational core skills that they can utilize if they ever find themselves in one of those extreme situations. And some of the clients that I bring out on these you know, survival trips and primitive skills trips I base it off of their pattern of life. There's no way I would bring you out into the bush and say, let's just go primitive. Like you just discussed, hey, I go camping in the backyard with my daughter. So it's very likely you and your daughter might be on a hike one day and something could happen. An injury, getting lost, uh, a severe storm. That is the real scenario. And that's what I like to train people for saying, well, let's, let's stick within what's normal in your life. And then let's throw a little curveball. So I'll have them pack what they would pack for a day hike, and then we go. And we spend the next three days out there going over how to make fire and shelter and, and collect clean water and, more importantly, signaling for help. Because they're not just out there mm. to live. They're out yeah, there yeah. to say, I need some help, and how do I signal for help? So you kind of have to play every survival scenario, you know, based on that person and what they'll ultimately be coming across. Uh, well, of course, you're on the Knife Junkie podcast, and I, I got very interested in your work through your flint napping. And before we get to that, yes, uh, I, I want to talk about your uh, your uh, Marine Corps service. And yeah. by the way, thank you for your service. Oh, my uh, pleasure. And I, I always like to say it, it it gave my family freedom when I wasn't serving, so I appreciate it greatly. Oh, my um, what... We talk to a lot of Marines here. We have a lot of Marines in the in the extended family, um, and they love knives and they, they do great man. knives. But what? <laughs> tell me about your Marine Corps training and and uh, what in that training led to where you are today, if yeah. if at all. Yeah. So my my military background had a big influence into kind of where I'm at today. One, it gave me a whole different sort of mental approach to life like the marine corps can really paint some horrible days as far as combat and and just some really rough training so i always have that to kind of fall back on because it will never be as bad as it was then so <laughs> it makes every day going forward pretty pretty easy but um i started off in the marine corps as an infantryman i was a uh, machine gunner a heavy machine gunner shooting 50 cals and mark 19s wow and then uh, yeah a lot of a lot of a lot of weight carrying there but um yeah. i love i love the infantry and from the infantry it kind of gave me a different aspect of bush time a lot of planning a lot of preparation a lot of equipment and as i progressed in my marine corps career i eventually made a lap move or a lateral move into the counterintelligence human intelligence field where i was essentially uh running uh, a variety of human based sources uh in the different areas i was and conducting interrogations 
with Al Qaeda types and oh, some pretty hardcore insurgents. But my job within that counter intel field was to embed with the uh, local population huh. and utilize them uh, as a source of information. And there was a reciprocity there. They'd exchange, you know, information with me, and I would offer, you know, uh, you know, ammunition, food, safety, a, a whole variety of things. But I really got to spend some time living with people. Uh, that were kind of outside of my normal pattern of life. So uh -huh. I think the Marine Corps with all the planning and prep and then a lot of that exposure time living with, you know, Bedouins in, in the Middle East to, you know, different jungle clans all throughout Southeast Asia. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It kind of gave me kind of this approach where like I have a lot of stuff, a lot of resources, in the military. But look at all these folks over here that can do all of these exact same mm. things with very, very little. And having always been a lover of the outdoors and history and kind of being outside, much like yourself, we grew up with no YouTube. And when we were in trouble, we had to go inside of the house instead of go outside and play. Um, yeah. I just kind of wanted to, <laughs> exactly. I just wanted to kind of carry that, that process uh, on. I really enjoyed the outdoors and I enjoyed learning from different cultures and how they went about ultimately you know, surviving and ultimately thriving into the world that we have today. So I love the core. It was, it was a great time. It, it sounds like you were doing sort of a, a, a civilian, um, a CAG kind of thing. Uh, my, my brother-in-law did some stuff where, uh, in the early part of, uh, desert, the, the second Iraq war where he was, yeah. uh, with the populations and, 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 and dealing with them. And, and yeah. he learned a lot from them too, culturally, but, uh, so that's pretty amazing because I know that they live with fewer resources and, Absolutely. uh, um, yeah. The, <laughs> so, so basically you're saying any day, uh, living the way you want to live is going to be easier, even if it's primitive than it was in the Marine Corps. I, I ah. respect that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I really think about it. No one's trying to blow me up with an ied or you know snipe me with a bullet so i'm like oh there's a few bears and moose they ain't got guns <laughs> yeah, i'm right. good you know <laughs> right no malice there just exactly. just nature exactly uh, <clears throat> so i want to ask you now do you live like you do in your videos because i watch and i'm like man uh it, it's it's very like i mentioned yeah. in my in my uh opening um uh, intro it's uh, i live vicariously through some of these videos i watch and i'm like man he lives in that little grotto or whatever <laughs> you know uh so so tell me about how you live and and how yeah. you incorporate all this into your life well it's it's interesting because you know i'm a father myself of two teenage uh sons and uh being a, a father is priority number one um for me it's without a doubt the most important thing so in order to maintain a a lifestyle that gives them the opportunity to i always say kind of have a normal life mm -hmm. <laughs> um i find myself living in a, a normal house half the time and then out in the bush with the remainder of the time and um you know my fiance that i'm marrying is is she's very much in the same kind of path she does a lot of medicinal plants and and foraging so there's there's a balance in that world uh, in this modern age, especially with being uh, responsible and, and interactive and, uh, you know, a tuned father, that um, I have to be there and I want to be there for my kids. I want to watch their lacrosse games and go to their parent teacher conferences as much as I can. There is still that continuous call uh, to head out in the bush. And I do go out there for, you know, extended periods of time. But they kind of understand that's what dad does. That's how dad makes his living. And um, they're they're OK with it. But. I mean, I've had, I've lived in the basements of people. I've lived out of my truck and I've, I've spent months living in caves um, and, you know, all around really just to experience um, what it is to truly kind of survive and thrive because I base everything I teach off of, off of ground truth. And ground truth is that firsthand experience of actually doing something. So even mm. in my book, everything that's written in that book is something I have done. There's no best theories or I heard from this guy who heard from this guy. Everything in there, I have probably without a doubt have failed up at, you know, failed first at it mm -hmm. and then found a success point moving through it by creative processes and problem solving. But for me, it's, I enjoy living out there. I mean, fortunately with my fiance, she is on board with us going out there, collecting mushrooms and living for a couple days and then coming back to 
watch a lacrosse game with my youngest son. It's it's a balance, and I've and I won't trade one for the other. You know, it's I mean, well, it sounds like one prepares you for the other. It sounds like a nice <laughs> balance. You know, like yeah. okay, got to go back into civilization, and then you're there. You're like, this is awesome. Can't wait to go back to the woods. Exactly. And I, I could totally see that as as exactly as a person not always 100% thrilled to be living, you know, uh, so close to Washington, DC, I could, I could really love to escape to the woods. Like, <laughs> all right. So let's, let's talk about the tool making, yes, um, sir. that, that, that is what drew me into your, to your channel and got me to, to, uh, be following you. Um, <laughs> there's one that I rewatched today, which was someone sent in a request. Can you make a war club? And you're like, <laughs> uh, oh yeah, I can. Yeah. Um, but let's talk about the flint napping. The knife yeah. is the first tool. How did you learn how to do this stuff? And show us something. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, this is this is an obsidian blade uh, that I made today. Um, oh, cool. Just just a nice one. And uh, you include your address. This one's coming right to you, Bob. Oh yes. Yeah, man. You, ah. you, you got to have some stone up on that wall. That's <laughs> I that's do. the rule. It'll go right there. <laughs> but yeah, right. so I mean. I mean, whether it's it's any sort of stone, um, I really enjoy uh, flint napping. And for me, flint napping was the process to really kind of understand what was our first like real survival skill. What was our first thing that we did that really kind of progressed us up that evolutionary ladder? And it was creating stone tools, stone tools in the form of, you know, simple little bifacial blades like this to cut away membrane and scrape a hide to sorry simple little razor blade stone flakes like this that you can process an entire animal with so in my flint napping journey i thought it was important to use the tools first though and that approach would help me understand how to make them so about 20 years ago, I found a guy that could make some obsidian tools. He made me a handful of stuff. I used them until there was nothing left. And then I felt like I kind of earned the right to start making them. And from there, I just started with simple stone flakes as your first tool, your first knife, really. This flake uh, right here, as you can kind of see, is a discoidal flake pulled off a core. But this is a knife. This is essentially a razor blade that I could cut a fireboard with, cut cordage with, I could really process an entire animal. As a matter of fact, on October 19th, I will be teaching a class um, to eight other students on how to butcher a bison, a 2,400 pound bison wow. with stone flakes and knives like this. Um, so my flint napping was all self-taught. There was no mm -hmm. YouTube at the time. I mean, there was a handful of books that I picked up to kind of understand terminology and best practices, but it was all trial and error. Every swing, every hit, every stitch, because I had to learn to give myself stitches because I was always cutting myself. Oh, uh, yeah, I've had some bad injuries from it. But Because every time you hit it, it's a razor blade fall into the floor. I wonder absolutely. how many times you've cut your feet. I mean, that's oh, yeah. My, my legs, when I hit a piece of stone, it's a razor blades coming off. So you got to watch your eyes and it all comes down to how you hit that stone and how you prepare it. But I've sliced my legs open. Um, I had to give, uh, do a chemical cauterization on my thumb because I slipped into a piece of obsidian and took out a quarter size chunk uh, out of my thumb. And I mean, it's, it's pretty dangerous, but it's, it's all manageable and negligible with, you know, the kind of the, the right approach into it. So I essentially taught myself um, how to flint nap. I started with glass bottles and some really poor choices in stone and kind of learned the hard way. But my approach to flint napping is in the primitive aspect. Um, it, there's, there's modern napping where a lot of guys will use copper. And for me, I use things like billets, you know, whether it's a piece of moose or a whitetail antler or a piece of caribou and an antler time from an elk, I'll use those to make the tools that I need. And the one reason why I kind of stick to this, the, the primitive or the all natural way is, all these things can be found naturally in the bush. So you can yeah. essentially find the tools that you need to make the tools to move forward into your uh, surviving and thriving. So even hammer stones that I can use to you know break stone with, I mean, everything is obtainable out in the bush. So I like that idea. And that's one of the challenges I like to do is 
go into the Chihuahua desert where I have uh, some property with nothing and just make everything that I need for maybe the mm. next two weeks or a single week. But flint napping is, it's, it's a hard skill. And I mean, it's a hard skill because people see it online and they see how easy it looks, but that person that's napping has probably spent some time, some blood and a lot of sweat to get to that point, especially when it comes to, you know, making, you know, knives like mm. this. The idea is this is all you really need to survive out in the bush. I mean, this, I enjoy just going out in the bush with a stone blade or even something smaller. Like this is my uh, little elk skin pouch. And I just like to bring this little bit of a hand blade <laughs> that's butted on one side, but this will open up fish, open up game, cut fireboards, cut fire. I pop it okay. in here and it's just, it's awesome. <laughs> so wait, wait, I, I, this, I, I need to divert just a touch okay. here uh, because yeah. I want to talk about how counterintuitive flint napping seems from my perspective. And I've done sculpture and a lot of creative stuff. And, uh, but I look at it, you hit it on one side, the rock falls off on the other side. Oh, okay. Let's just talk about it right now. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> uh, uh, but I want to get back to that little pouch and the yeah. anxiety it gives me. Uh, we'll, we'll be back to that. Uh, but uh, so you hit the rock you with a small rock or the yeah. round rock. You hit it on the top. A flake comes off the bottom. It's yep. like it's it's like you're sculpting the bottom of it, but you're working the top of it. Yeah. So it's if you think of every piece of stone, and this is a piece of Georgetown church. This is a little bit smaller piece. But the objective is to take this thick piece of stone and thin it down so it's bifacial. So two sides. And when it's in that bifacial form, it allows me to manipulate the edges through pressure to ultimately kind of get to the shape that I want. So if I hold a piece of my stone, I'll kind of do it up high. In order to do that, I'm, I'm striking the stone with a hard hammer. And when I'm striking it, what I'm doing is I'm creating what's called a Hertzikin cone. We've all fired a BB gun mm. at a windshield at some point in our lives. <laughs> <laughs> and when that BB strikes the windshield, it creates a perfect 90 degree cone. So by me understanding that philosophy in my head and then taking this stone and hitting it at different angles, I essentially can mm. create a chunk of that 90 degrees. So if I hit this, I've just kind of popped off a single flake just like that. And if I replace it, I can see where I struck it and how much of that 90 degree cone came right off on the bottom. Oh, so yeah. I've got half the cone going this way and the other half going this way based on my point of impact. So through manipulation and flipping of the stone, I can keep popping off flakes <laughs> <laughs> until I get it into a bifacial form, which can then be turned into a knife, a projectile point, really anything. So you're saying that every time you hit it, it's going to come off at some sort of 90 degree angle, depending on how you strike it, like yes. just as a rule? Yeah, as a rule. So it's, it's, That's weird. it's, it's a... It's a bit of technology that early on nobody understood, right? But until we started to kind of get into the science of it, but through those strikes, because stone doesn't like to break at 90 degrees. If I hold it like this and take this stone and hit it like this, mm -hmm. eventually with enough force, time, effort, and energy, I can get this stone to break. But if I manipulate my stone, give myself a different angle, and I strike it into that stone, think of that BB coming into that windshield, and right where I strike it, I'm creating that cone. So it's just a, a quick pop. And then oh, that man. blade just slides right off there. <clears throat> and when you replace it, you can see right on this backside right there, you can see the angle from yeah. where it was coming down. So you think there's half of the angle and then the other angle half is right there. And you've got your, your first knife, as I like to say. This is so, your first knife. So it, 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 instead of um, like if you're learning how to do stock removal with a bar of steel, you have a bunch of dust you can't see. But with this, every time you strike it, you can kind of line it back up and analyze your strike, basically. Yes. And go back into it a different way if you want a different result. Exactly. With every strike, you do a little strike analysis saying, all right, where I hit this piece of stone, it came off in that perfect kind of uh chunk of that 90 degree if i hit it too high and i'll do like a improper hit i kind of broke off a much shallower piece yeah. of stone. Yeah. but if i just take it and then i instead of coming down i come at an angle that's how i'm going to be removing more of that stone and i want thin slices to come off the thin slices that come off are tools 
And that can be worked into an arrow point, but I can use this chunk to say, all right, I can get a small knife out of this and I can get about 30 or 40 of these little flakes that I can use as razor blades to process game. And I can use the knife that comes out of here to score cut around a tree and, you know, use it. <laughs> so, so you rough it in now with the big stones, like you're just doing hitting, yep. uh, hitting at the angle, knocking off those nice razor blades that can turn into game processing knives or arrowheads. And then you have to get more specific. You have to get a little more granular. Then what do you do? Yeah. So once I've gotten it down into uh, a much thinner phase, so a hard hammer is going to remove a little bit more stone. That's when I can go to something like a soft billet. So all of my antlers, which come in various sizes, I mean, this is a big piece of moose and that's a whitetail antler, but that's going to remove a smaller flake. And where it seems counterintuitive is when somebody takes a piece of stone that they want it, they want it to be sharp and they rough the edges. Oh. And when they rough those edges, you're thinking about the properties of the stone. Because stone that's razor sharp on a spall like this will crush under the impact of a hard hammer or a soft billet. But if I abrade the edge, basically I'm reinforcing it. And then when I strike, let's see if I can do it up this high, I can pop off a much thinner flake oh. and rip the flakes off. So wait, wait, wait. You're saying you can you can get that thin flake if you do that sort of roughing it up first? Absolutely, because oh, wow. when I'm striking with an antler, I'm just catching the edge. This is how it's looking. When I hit it with a stone, I'm coming above my edge. I'm okay. looking to hit it up here. Yeah. So stone removes a lot more mass, and the antler actually rips a flake off because stone can be elastic at times, which is kind of one of the good properties of stone. So when I rough that edge... It reinforces it, and it gives me the opportunity to hold it. Sometimes you miss. <laughs> there you go. And it allows me to pop a flake off. Wow. And all of those flakes are super razor thin. And there's varying degrees based on the size of the stone, the size of your billet, on, on what you actually want to use. You don't want to use something too big like this on a stone like this. I could just wind up breaking it into smaller chunks. So... If you look at all of my billets, and I have many of them of various sizes, they all serve a certain kind of timeline in that stone. So when I'm mm. getting to a thin phase, I roll to something very, very small that's just ripping super micro tiny flakes off of it. And when I need to go something bigger, I use a much bigger billet. So I've seen you also use a very thin <clears throat> port, like tine of an antler or something, just to like make yeah. sort of serrations or... Uh, yeah, the, so the very edge. So that's called pressure flaking. And what pressure flaking is, is once I've kind of gotten a, a, a piece of stone into a bifacial form, this allows me to shape it. And it also allows me to sharpen those edges. And what I'm doing is essentially I'm taking the edge of my flaker, and this is a piece of caribou. I'm mm -hmm. pushing it into the edge and then popping the flake off. Oh. So I do that into my hand and I push and I pop, push, and I pop the whole way around and it allows me to shape the stone. More importantly, if I have a knife, this is how we sharpen our stone knives. If my knife becomes dull, I can go around with my pressure flaker and just readdress my edge with little micro flakes. And essentially it gives me one serrated blade the whole way around. Mm. So all stone tools. So this is an early type of Danish dagger. If I was to use this, let's say, God, I've been using this for about three months now. Say if I use this for a year, it's going to drop in length and it's going to drop in its width. Mm -hmm. Because as I sharpen it, I'm taking little pieces of the stone off and eventually its shapes change. So how, how often is that? Uh, do you need to resharpen it with every use or... Uh, it, it's it's a good rule of thumb. It's just like like any knife. Once you've used it extensively, whether it's for butchering, butchering or doing a lot of like, you know, wood shaping, uh, it's best to keep it sharp because it just you avoid injuries. You know, we all know this sharp blades yeah. cut clean. Um, so as it just dulls out, I just resharpen it, you know. Well, let me ask you this. OK, so you, you yes, live uh, 
part of the time kind of um in in at, well it in a more well in a house and then you live yeah. out in the bush uh I know you you don't live for the videos. I know the videos are are part of what you do, but when you go out into the when you go back to your wilderness home, so yeah. to speak, you have all your tools there. I would assume already made. But how often do you have to refresh? How often do you show up to your wilderness home and say, "Oh, geez, I need a a new knife this time" or that kind yeah. of thing? Yeah, you know, I th I think it's one of those things. That's this is kind of like my my drug of choice is making stone tools. So I'm <laughs> yeah, always right. it's just like anybody that's into knives. They're like, oh, you know, I should get this one. I should get this. So I'm always mm -hmm. making them. Um, so it's it's sometimes if I'm going to a unique environment, let's say if I'm going to Africa, maybe I'll make a stone blade for that trip and I'll mm -hmm. use it for that trip, and then I will kind of cash it away and be like, oh, this is kind of my memory stone. I remember all the things I did with it, but if I'm rolling out into the bush, let's just say for two weeks, um, I like to bring, you know, a chunk of stone and then make my tools when I'm out there. Okay. Um, it requires a little bit of time, but that's kind of that. I, I don't mind it. <laughs> I guess you could say. And well, that's kind of your mindset while you're out there, right? You yeah. have a lot of time, a lot of time and a lot of time. And if you make your tools, you know, kind of um, as they're needed, but you you have a couple good core cutting tools. You really can't go wrong. And I think a lot of the videos, a lot of things that I do, I always tell people that you're getting about 10% of Donnie. Mm -hmm. Like there's so many times where I don't even record anything. I'm just out living. I'm hunting, I'm foraging, I'm doing any number of things. So when the camera's on, you're getting this small chunk of, of me. And sometimes I try to do these, you know, videos where I'm out for two or three days, but when the batteries run out, that's it. Yeah, yeah, it's a, I keep uh, it right. simple. So, so I have this. Uh, I, I have a boar hunting fantasy that comes from the Odyssey that my wife laughs at me. Uh, but in recent years, I have a squirrel hunting and eating uh, nice. because, like I said, uh, right here, you know, I it's not looked upon so nicely for me to kill a neighborhood squirrel and eat it. But you know, I'm not, I I'm certainly, uh, you know, not above that. And, and I've looked into it. I've looked into recipes and stuff. And it's funny what you see, you see recipes that it's like, well, if you have all those ingredients, why are you eating squirrel in the first place? But sure. uh, let me ask you when you're out in the bush yeah. and you're, you're, you're hunting your food, what, what do you look for most uh, what's your favorite food to eat out there? A, yeah. B, do you do you trap more or do you hunt more like with bows you make and that kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, that's that's a fair question. So my mentality is I fish first. I always hmm. fish first. Typically, if you can see the fish in the water. Uh, if they're in a stream, they're they're kind of hanging in that stream. And I just like to pull them out with my hand, whether it's a couple of trout or really everything and anything. Wait, wait, if, wait. If Pull them out food, like Bigfoot. You just kind of stand yeah, there in the river and grab them. So yeah, trout are kind of unique. So if they see you coming, they're going to shoot to the sides or go underneath the rock and they're going to stay there. So you just get down in the water and just kind of stick your hand up underneath. You'll feel the belly. And I just slide my hands right to the gills, pull them out and you, you know, you have three or four fish. <laughs> it's, yeah, I, I don't even bring a line or tackle, but um, <laughs> that's if, so cool. I love that. Let's say fishing isn't an opportunity. Um, I'm definitely targeting. Well, I, I should preface this. I, I stick within all the rules and regulations based on the states and where I'm hunting um, sure, yeah. and what I'm hunting with. Um, so one of the beautiful things about Colorado and some of the places I go is small game hunting is, is a long season. So and a lot of things fall within that small game. And if it's winter time here, I know there's, you know, snowshoe hares and rabbits and, you know, raccoons and all sorts of things that I can take. And if that's the case, I'm, I'm just typically bringing a bow with me because it's, it's far easier. And the challenge of hunting is always going to exist. But for me, it's, it's really just getting some, some meat on the, uh, <laughs> meat on the skewer, so to speak. But when I'm, hunting for large game like i have a mule deer tag i'm filling and then a um an elk tag that's that's for food for the family if, if you know what i mean that's yeah that'll be our food all through the winter along with the bison that we're going to butcher um so hunting is kind of twofold it's it's resources it's the hides that i have and the bones and all those sort of things um 
in that kind of traditional form of hunting with a bow. But if I'm out in the bush for a couple days and I can hunt with a very primitive means of hunting, something like a rabbit stick or an atlatl or mm. um, a stone sling or bow, I like to go with what is appropriate and legal in that area. And then I just try to get it on. And the beautiful part is sometimes you, you're completely unsuccessful. Anybody who's hunted knows like, yeah, you can be within 150 yards of, of some sort of mule deer or elk or moose and you, you've got a rifle, but the wind changes and that thing's taken off mm -hmm. and you still have a rifle. So imagine doing it with, you know, a rabbit stick or some sort of bow where you got to get up nice and close. That's kind of that challenge. And I, I'll tell you, I go many days without eating. The one thing I won't do is when my dog Finn comes with me, I'll always pack him something because like, mm, yeah. I'm like it's, if I suck that day, I can't let you start. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. So, well, I bet those kind of days like uh, make you uh, pine for the caveman days when they were out uh, in groups, uh, yeah. all with their stone uh, spears and all that, yeah. uh, you know, taking down the Mastodon uh, as a group. Uh, are you ever tempted and I'm not saying you don't use them, but I'm, I'm not sure. Are you ever tempted by modern tools when you're out sure. uh, in the bush? And sure. uh, do, you, do you just, okay, today I'm going to use this modern tool or yeah. do you? I mean, like this right here is my, uh, my Boma, as I call it. So this was a Bolo machete that I cut about six inches off, put a new handle on there. It's yeah. got a flex to it. I can scrape with it. But this is one of my preferred like all around sort of bush tools. If I know I'm going to be doing some heavy chopping, uh, this guy's, you know, it's, it's coming with me. So this is modern. If, um, in the, if in the state of Colorado, I don't, um, get an archery tag. And the only thing I can do is a December pronghorn hunt. Then that's mm -hmm. what I'm going to do to get that meat. Because the large is that a meat, rifle? Is that, is that what you said? Yeah. Is that a rifle? Okay. That, that'd be, a, that'd be a rifle in that case. But I mean, having two teenage boys and a couple dogs <laughs> and, you know, yeah. You got to put some meat on the table. Yeah. So it's you could stop at the teenage boys, but the dogs just uh... <laughs> that's it. So, so so that machete you were holding up, uh, yeah. I, I I recently watched a video where you were using that. Uh, you used to chop down a tree, and then you did some scraping with it, and yeah, all sorts of stuff. It, that that machete has a great sound, by the way, which is a uh -huh. thing that some of us knife nerds uh, <laughs> think about, but. Uh, yeah. But it's interesting to me that you consider that modern. That's modern because that's modern heat treated steel. But yeah. most people would consider that, you know, maybe that's not such a modern tool. Is that about as far as you go in terms of um, yeah, accommodations? I, mean, I think when, when it comes to blades, I'll either carry this guy with me. I, I just like it because I can sharpen it on like a rotten log and sand. That's a, yeah. it's a real easy way of sharpening it. But if I'm going, you know, let's say I'm going to have a relaxing weekend. I mean, I'll bring something like a, a puku or something like that. I kind of mm. like that smaller blade, especially something I can get a good stock on. And I just, I use this kind of uh, back one third of that blade right yeah. here. That's my mass removal. And it's just a, a reliability thing for me. And, you know, if I'm going, let's say um, I'm going to, I'm going to go out elk hunting and I'm bringing a primitive bow. I know for, for me, I will be, you know, bringing stone tools with me and that's how I'll process that animal out. But if I'm guiding folks, if I'm, if I'm doing a traditional survival class, I'm going to bring a modern knife. And, mm -hmm. you know, part of that is showing folks how to maintain them. What is good, you know, situational awareness with your knife? Yeah. What are my key areas on a blade that I can actually carve with and then slice with? And, you know, it's, it's teaching folks in that respect. That's when I employ a little bit more of that modern stuff. But if it's just Donnie and he's not recording, I'm in buckskins, uh, animal furs, and maybe I'll bring, <laughs> <That's so cool. laughs> I'll bring some, some rock salt with me. I always like to carry a little salt. It's not a bad thing. Such modern luxury, sir. I know, you should man. be ashamed. I'm getting soft. I'm getting soft. <laughs> uh, so I want to go back to that little pouch. Yeah. Uh, this seems like the appropriate time. Yeah. So sometimes you'll just let out for the territories and this is the only thing you have on you. Yeah. So this is, Oh my God. This is my cutting tool right here. Um, just a simple little hand blade and it's butted. So that's a little bit of the cortex. When you looked at um, any one of these stones, there's typically a cortex on them. And then there's the raw stone on the inside. So I keep a little cortex there. That's the handle that kind of pushes into my hand and I can saw and cut with it. And then in mm -hmm. this pouch, I have a pressure flaker and my leather, my little pouch oh, here acts as it. my hand pad. 
So this gives me the ability to carry my, my blade, sharpen my blade, and I've got the tools necessary to ultimately maintain it. And I call it a pit pouch because it goes over my shoulder and it just rests right underneath my, right under, my the arm. right under the armpit. It never comes off. It stays on there. And it's just, this is, in my personal opinion, this is all you really need. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. So Don, Donnie, I'm yes, going to tell you why your pouch gives me anxiety because I just recently um, purged my EDC backpack. It's okay. I just carry it from home to work. And, uh, you know, I work in a place where it could get shot up. So I'm, I, I kind of <laughs> keep extra stuff with me, but um, you know, uh, I, it's, it, it ends up being 50 pounds. I'm like, what do I have in here? I open it up. I've got a couple of tourniquets. I got a whole bunch of bandages. I got four knives. I got all this. I got tons yeah. of fishing, like between here and work, there's no opportunity to fish. I don't know why I have that gear in there. So I got rid of it all. And, and, and at first I felt like, Oh my God, like I'm naked going to work. Yeah. And uh, now it feels so much better. I'm 20 pounds lighter. There you um, go. <laughs> do, do we rely on too much crap in the modern day? I, I don't think we rely on too much crap. I think what we rely on is, uh, assurance. And I think it's better to have than to, mm. you know, have not. I mean, in, in my truck, I've got my emergency road gear and I have just enough stuff that is seasonal based on kind of where I go. Uh, come along to get me out some straps. If I got to pull somebody else out enough food and water to keep me alive for 72 hours until I could flag down a vehicle. Mm -hmm. More importantly, I got a pack in there. If I need to walk to a nearest town, I've got enough stuff in that pack that will aid me in that walk. I don't go too high into the extreme, but I, I'm very much prepared. And like, even when I'm traveling to, you know, South America, Central America, wherever, here's a little fun fact. TSA cannot pick up stone knives in any of your very own <laughs> luggage. So <laughs> this and all sorts of blades come with me. So I'm, I'm very much in that same sort of respect. I mean, even on my day to day, I'll carry a small little, little pocket knife, a little, little buck knife, something to that extent. But, um, I mean, it's important. I think you got, you got to have that stuff, especially nowadays. I mean, I don't, I don't mess around with it. I mean, as, as primitive as I like to go out and adventure, do my thing, I still have the necessary requirements mm -hmm. okay. to, uh, you know, get me out of a situation. Cause that's really what it is. I mean, I've got a harvest, right. Freeze dryer sitting here. I've got stockpiles of food because in Colorado, we get some bad winters Yeah, and, my mentality is not to stay in one place. My mentality is to be mobile. A couple days here, a couple days there. Because as soon as you stay in place, you get complacent and it's game over. It's For me, it's always moving. So I have lighter stuff based off of my kind of my pattern of, uh, of life and that sort of, you know, bug out sort of scenario. So I'm always moving. And I'm going to go to places where nobody else wants to go. <laughs> take up those resources there uh so uh you mentioned you're the father of sons i'm the father of daughters but we're both the father of kids like Absolutely. these days and um no matter how much you try there's still kids living these days what kind of advice do you have uh for fathers and mothers uh if there are any who listen to this show uh <laughs> fathers and mothers uh of of kids today who are teens or younger um in terms of getting them interested in the outdoors and pulling them out of their devices and the yeah. and the virtual world yeah i think that's that's a difficult question because every i Having two sons, I do not parent my sons the exact same way. They're two different mm -hmm. people. Yeah. And I know how they respond and how they need, you know, my attention and how they don't need my attention at different times. So I think with, um, in, in my situation, maybe this would overlay on some other folks, is that parents need to take charge. They, they, they have to be the ones that say, all right, hey, drop your stuff. We're all going to do this. And my mm -hmm. boys know the difference between an invite and a request. <laughs> if they do, if I'm inviting them saying, Hey, you know, me and Marissa, we're going to go, um, we're going to go do X, Y, and Z. Do you guys want to come along? Oh, you know, I've got homework. I've got practice. Cool. That's an invite. But if I show up and say, Hey, this is what we're doing tomorrow. They know the difference. And I think parents, they like to be friends to their kids. And I've told my boys for many years, I am not your friend. Yes. I am your father. And once we <laughs> understand that dynamic, um, it's it's good to go. And I live by a couple simple rules, teach them how to think, not necessarily what to think. And they can't be me. They have to be themselves. 
they've been exposed to so many different things that I've done over my life just through, you know, hey, hey, boys, we got to butcher out this bison and we're in, in the back processing it out or we're cleaning ducks, whatever. They've had that exposure. But if they're wanting to dive into things, I can show them, but I want them to pursue their own interests. And, you know, it just works. My oldest boy, who's 18, takes off in a couple days. Uh, he's got a one-way ticket to uh, Spain. He speaks Ooh. Spanish and French, and he's backpacking like the Cristobal Santa, Santiago Trail for a month. Then he's going to Africa and Southeast Asia. And I mean, he just turned 18 in June, and he's like, I'm not ready for college. Got himself a job, saved up a bunch of money. He's financing it on his own. So I'm like, go wow. for it, my dude. Yeah, go, go do your thing. And I think that I have taught him how to think and life is full of adventure life is full of opportunities but you have to kind of go out and get them and i will help guide you i will lead you by example mm -hmm. but you have to make these these hard choices so parents don't be friends how to think not necessarily what to think and uh, constantly lead by example that's it if you're on your phone they're going to be on their phone yep right. oh yeah 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 100 and uh and, and also the um uh you know, uh, I'm not your friend, uh, but that's so much better than a friend. I'm your father. That's yeah. so much better than a friend. Friend will Absolutely. leave you. Friends come and go, whatever. Uh, yeah. I'll never leave you. Um, so, yeah, th those are those are some of kind of like really important things I'm also trying to instill. Um, let me ask you this as we close here. Yes, Let's sir. get some primitive advice, if you will, <laughs> uh, for the modern man. Like what are the kind of things that modern men who might be wrapped up in their corporate jobs or their modern way of life and uh, just bombarded by news and information. Uh, what kind of advice can you give people from the past, from what you've learned? Yeah, well, I think the easiest thing to really understand is that um, we all come from the natural world. It won't lie. It won't cheat. It won't steal. It asks nothing of us. It is the purest form of honesty that could exist. And when we take small steps, whether it's a single day hike or an overnight or a weekend camping, you will start to build up your own personal self-reliance and then your understanding and connection to that natural world. And I think when people start to just dip that toe in, they start to gain an appreciation for the seasons and when leaves start to fall and when the snow starts to fall and when animals are in the rut. We all come from the natural world. We should not be afraid of it we should have a confidence being within it given you know certain environments and parameters but we should want to go there and if if you're in that question of like hey i'm in i'm in the dc metro area how do i get to those wild places a wild place can be discovered for you for the very first time and it's a brand new discovery they exist and there could be a, a car rustling in the background but that oak tree could have been grown for the past 150 years yeah. i mean it's got a story so just just make small attempts to go out there grab a book like mine wild wisdom that will help guide you in that path and um yeah i mean every every step out there's a step in the right direction couldn't say it better obviously but donnie before i let you go let's let's talk about uh, uh how people can find your book and uh and where they can catch up with you and keep up with you Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I'm on all the, the social medias minus Facebook and it's just Donnie Dust um, on Instagram and TikToks and all the other sort of stuff my kids have forced me to join. Um, and then uh, DonnieDust.com is really the best place to pick up my book um, on there as well as my link for survival mastery, my you know online uh, survival bushcraft homesteading sort of training. But yeah, DonnieDust.com is really the place to kind of go. I think there's links to YouTube and uh, book links and everything's on there. So it's, it's just kind of where I post and share things. So you can't forget the name Donnie dust. It's, it's, <laughs> it's a chore. Nobody likes to do dusting. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, well, uh, we're going to talk a few extra minutes for our Patreon members and, and we're going to talk a little bit about the other, your platform and, and ways you can uh, connect with you uh, in terms of training, which sounds Absolutely. super cool. Uh, but Donnie, I want to thank you for coming on the knife junkie podcast. I thank really you. appreciate it. It's been great talking with you. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've watched so many of these episodes and oh, cool. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan as well. So I, for somebody who loves stone tools, I do like kind of learn, especially when you pull out your big swords and you go, ah, <laughs> I enjoy <laughs> well. it. I enjoy it, man. So no, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, my it. pleasure. Take care, sir. Right on. The Shockwave Tactical Torch is your ultimate self-defense companion. 
Featuring a powerful LED bulb that lasts 100,000 hours, a super-sharp, crenulated bezel, and a built-in stun gun delivering 4.5 million volts. Don't settle for ordinary. Choose the Shockwave Tactical Torch. The KnifeJunkie.com slash Shockwave. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Donnie Dust. Be sure to check him out on YouTube and Instagram. His videos are addictive, and uh, you'll get a vicarious rush out of them until you yourself are out there living in the wild. Also, check out his book, Wild Wisdom, published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, go to DonnieDust.com and, well, everywhere else, Simon & Schuster sells their books to get it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us here. Be sure to join us on Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives. For Jim working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Podcast.